Hi, I'm Mike Bush. I'm Paul New. And I'm Colleen Sterling. Welcome to Ask the AMPs from AMPs. take your toughest maintenance questions and we try to solve them. So if you have a question, reach out to us at podcasts at AOPA.org. And if you like the show, make sure to follow or subscribe so you never miss an episode. And to get on our email list for our monthly newsletter and maintenance stories, uh, simply text the word SAVVY, that's S-A-V-V-Y, to 33777. Uh, and our mail bot will ask you for your email address and put you on the list. So once again, text SAVVY, S-A-V-V-Y, to 33777 to get on the list. So I discovered we have an entire new listener base. You're going to love it. <clears throat> and we're going we're gonna to have to ask these new listeners to send us emails so that we know how many we have, whether it's one or two or three. <clears throat> so it's not, I'm, it's not the local prison, is it, Paul? No, I tried them. They they refused. But okay. anyway, so Clay and I, a friend of mine, uh, are talking, uh, you know, after church last week. And he says, the weirdest thing happened at my house the other day. He said, I'm in the living room and I hear these people talking in my kitchen. And I'm thinking nobody's at the house except for Christy, who's in the kitchen. And who is Christy talking to? And then I realized one of those people was you. I was not at your house, Clay. I promise. I was not at your house. He said, I went in the kitchen and I had firmly identified that you were in there talking. People are laughing. It's a party. And I go in the kitchen and my wife, Christy, is listening to your podcast. <laughs> now, Christy is not an aviator. Clay is not an aviator. They fly commercially and that's it. So I, I have to go find Christy. I found Christy. Why are you listening to an aviation podcast? She said, it's so much fun. I just laugh all the time. I have no clue what you're talking about, but there's just a lot of laughter and I enjoy laughing. So she, <laughs> so it's she a cleans the routine. kitchen okay. while she's listening, listening to, to the us. podcast. Oh boy. That's <laughs> so uh, we have at least one non-traditional listener. We just need to make sure our content, you know, is slanted to all of our listeners. Okay. So no, no dirty <laughs> words or, or graphic stories, right? So, well, you know, keep, I mean, keep it clean. That's what you're saying. <laughs> you say, I think he's saying we're not supposed to get too deep in the weeds. Yeah, don't, oh. we need to stay out of the weeds. You know, don't need to be too net to on. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I, I was okay. in shock that she that was would... directed at you, Mike. No weeds. Uh -huh. <laughs> no. I weeds. cut. I cut the grass. I stay above the weeds. Stay above the weeds. I, oh. Yeah. I wonder how many, many people listen to car, car talk who didn't own cars. I don't know. I think actually a lot did. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, and, you know, they, they charged extra for marital counseling because uh. <clears throat> they got a lot of calls from, you know, the, you don't want to say the non-driving spouse, but <clears throat> anyway, that. we have at least one listener that's non -ADHD. Our first question is from Greg, who has a question before he begins squeezing that paint gun. Go ahead, Greg. How are you guys doing today? I appreciate yeah. you having me on the show. Glad awesome. to have you. Yeah. I'll make my question a little more specific than in my email. I, I currently live in, uh, in Utah in the Salt Lake Valley, where priming really isn't an issue um, if I was just going to be staying in the area. Uh, but in the RV10 I'm about to build, I'm really wondering if I take the time to do it. My in-laws live in Tacoma. They, the airport I would fly in there is Tacoma Narrows, which is right on the sound. And then my family lives in New England, Maine and Vermont, which is also an extremely humid area. And I'd probably be having the plane stay there for extended weeks. I'll call it a month, maybe two months out of the year. And I didn't know if that would justify spending the time to prime the inside of the airplane, or if I should, uh, you know, save myself the time and energy and get to the finish line more quickly. So I'm glad you qualified that because in your, in the question that I'm reading, all it says is, should I prime the airplane? And I didn't get that you meant the inside. <clears throat> I was thinking, well, yeah, if you're going to put paint on, you're going to put primer underneath. That's how you make it stick. Mm -hmm. Makes a lot more sense now. I, I get it. Um, since I'm already talking, 
<laughs> the, the, <laughs> I'm always already talking. <clears throat> the Cessnas that I spend a lot of time working on were never primed from the factory. Right. So like Colleen's Cardinal, mm -hmm. no primer on the inside. It has a layer of pure aluminum on each side of the alclad, which is what alclad means. And uh, they've only lasted, how long has your airplane lasted, Colleen, with no primer? It's like 40 years? Six, 50, yeah. 50, yeah, 40, yeah. 40 something years mm -hmm. with no primer. Uh, that's terrible. And she lives in, in San Diego. So okay. it's, it seems to be surviving okay. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I, I 40 years from now, you may work, you may revisit that. But, 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 so you're going to leave the inside completely unpainted. That's just to kind of shortcut, just make it quicker to fly. Did well get to the finish line quicker. Yeah. I've, I've, on all the, you know, Vans Air Force, I'm building an RV 10 mm -hmm. and everything that you read, everybody's generally all over the place as far as every, you're either a primer or people say, just don't worry about it skip that step uh, you, you, you have the alclad alum, aluminum so you're protected and everybody makes the point that uh you know th there's plenty of planes out there that that have no primer on them at all on the inside um but I, as a builder I'm, I'm assuming i'm going to scuff up the inside a little bit and some of that clad is going to get worn but maybe that's not maybe i'm thinking too much about it well plus Plus, the alclad is vulnerable every, every place it's cut and every place it's drilled. Yeah. Um, and the, the, you know, the corrosion typically will start uh, like on the edge of a, of a panel. Um, I can't imagine not not priming it. it as Paul pointed out, you know, the Cessna never primed the the inside of their airplanes um, unless they were ordered as a seaplane. Um, and, and then when they restarted production in 94, uh, they went to the opposite extreme. Literally every piece of aluminum that gets riveted on those airplanes is, is, is dunked in a tank of, uh, epoxy primer before it ever gets riveted on so that everything is, is primed inside and out every, every, every piece of aluminum. But the real question is how long is it going to last? I mean... I hate to, you well, know, like the military builds airplanes that are disposable or they used it during the war. Right. And they, yeah. they're still around. Well, and I think that's why Cessna, when Cessna was building those airplanes back in the 60s and 70s, um, they assumed that the useful life of those airplanes would be about 10 years. It never occurred to them that people were going to be flying them for 50 years. Uh, <clears throat> and, and, and the main reason people are flying them for 50 years is because, first of all, they stopped production. And sort of forced the issue, and then when they restarted production, um, uh, prices were were so much higher than they were before. Um, you know, I've owned three airplanes in my life, and and the first two airplanes I bought brand new. Uh, the third airplane, which is the one that I've owned for thirty five years now, was my first second hand airplane, and and the reason. It was everything changed back back in the old days. There were there were these wonderful tax incentives, uh, and investment tax credit, and all that stuff, where the government li literally bribed you to buy new new stuff and and would you know pay for half of it with tax breaks and stuff. And all that went away uh, during the Reagan administration, and uh, the economics totally changed. I suspect also it'll be a little bit tough to prime the inside after it's been built, like getting into all right. the Right. No, you, you, yeah, you, all you, over the you pulleys. Need, you, need, and... you need to do it before before it's put together, and that's what yeah. that's what Cessna now does with all of their airplanes. Um, I think it they does, learned they learned their lesson. It does increase a, a lot of labor to prime those skins before you put them on. That's a lot of work. I think now that I understand <clears> the question. Um, I would vote for not priming and just make a nice interior and cover it up. I think it'll probably, <laughs> it'll probably outlast you. And what's, what's that noise the engine's making? I don't know. Just turn up the radio a little louder. It'll be, it'll be fine. No. I, yeah, I was I, hoping to skip priming and go with yeah. the, uh, I forget what? the fog that you guys have said. I know I've heard it. In yeah. Past, like uh, corrosion uh, X or ACF 50. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. can do that. You can um, do that. I, I would probably, but that doesn't were, have, that doesn't last very long. You have to do it every couple yeah. of years. 
it, I think if I were in your position, and I was actually back in 2004, I had an RV 10 that I was building. Hmm. And when our, our hangar burned down, so did the RV 10. And that was kind of the end of that. But um, I think I would go with not priming the inside and maybe spraying a light coat of AV8 uh, or Bow Shield, which is a, it dries to kind of a hard wax consistency. And you can spray it at any time. And it won't get all over, well, it kind of will get all over everything, but uh, it, it'll it do a, a really good job and it's it can be done after the fact. And we do it on okay. live airplanes and it's a one-time, it's a one-time deal. Ah, I like that. Just as an option. But there's, well, there's nothing nicer than a really clean, shiny aluminum inside of an airplane. Yeah, yeah. that's pretty. I, I don't know. <laughs> Are we, I, ooh, do I hear I'm, I'm the outlier here and I don't really understand why why it's it's so much additional work to, to prime this stuff before you rivet it on but it's a lot of cleaning and setup for each individual part yeah you and want the, to paint all at once you don't want to paint each yeah. little piece as it comes out of the box I could see yeah. that yeah no, of course and, of, of yeah. course and those RVs have a lot of pieces <laughs> have you started yet Greg no, <clears throat> sorry. I was supposed to get my uh, my empennage kit this month, uh, but unfortunately, supply chain issues have uh, pushed that back, and my new estimated crating date is um, December, mm -hmm. and hopefully my wings come uh, December of next year. So I'm going to give right. myself a, a year to build the tail. That's my goal. <laughs> it's about 400 man hours, or woman hours, or people hours. It's 400 hours or For so. what? To for... To put the tail together. Oh, just the tail. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, we, Dad and I had a blast doing it. But what finally kind of slowed us down, you know, we'd been working on airplanes since I was a six-year-old. Um, but when you work on the same kind of airplane, production airplanes, I can, I can pick up a little piece of a 210 and with no other reference tell you what it came off of. But when I opened that box of RV parts none of it was familiar. And so every little part, we had to go figure out what it went to and boy, it really slowed down the process. The actual building part went really fast, but figuring out, you know, slot A is filled with tab B and, you know, that kind of stuff, <laughs> that, that was really slow. Hmm. For sure. Hmm. Well, I'm, I'm hoping my 10 year old daughter keeps me on track. She seems excited to do this with me and I'm hoping it's a fun family project. Yeah. yeah Cause that's so. the biggest thing. You know, you get all excited and you go for a while and then you kind of lose the excitement getting mm -hmm. the kids involved. I, that'd be awesome. Yeah. yeah. That's that the way to do cool. it. I don't know. They, they built an RV in, in one week at air venture this year. What? It wasn't an RV. It was a, a Vans. Uh, no, oh, that's right. A, no, that's right. It was, it was a, a Sonics Zenith. this year. Oh, Sonics. Sonics, yeah. yeah. It was, it was an RV the previous time that they With did. With 5,000 people worked on it, right? Including, yeah. my, including well, that, Mike that, Bush. That, yeah, that probably slowed it down quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Greg, you had another question about engine selection. Oh, I, well, I, I did, actually. Um, I forgot about that. Um, the, the price tag, especially since the recent increase, is uh, there's a little bit of sticker shock for mm -hmm. a new IO540. Okay. And I was wondering, would you, if, if you were me, would you go out to the market and see what's out in the used world? Or would you just go factory new on a, on a kit build plane since everything else is going to be brand new? I, I well, suspect that Vans gives you a super discount because they do a group buy on those engines. Well, I, it's I about think, sixty-six, I, I think, without the I, propeller. I think what you what you need to do is is go to Air Power and see what they sell that same engine for, because they're mm -hmm. the, the kind of the biggest distributor of of Continental and Lycoming engines, and they they list all of their prices on the on their website, and that that'll give you a good sanity check on whether Vance is giving you a good deal or not. And um, I I have to make a reality uh, check comment. <clears throat> my view and everybody has an opinion uh it's going to be a couple of years before you're even close to needing an engine that's true <laughs> if you buy an engine now even if it's at a big discount it's going to sit mm -hmm. and that's one of the worst things you can do even with a new engine with all the build-up oil and stuff um, i would 
just a personal opinion, I wouldn't get the engine until you had something to hang it on. Yeah. And I wouldn't buy any avionics until you had a master oh, yeah. switch in the airplane ready to turn on. Because the engine, you don't want it to sit. And you may come across a used engine somewhere that's a great deal. Right. And the avionics, two or three years from now, they'll, they'll be ob putting, obsolete. Yeah. They'll be, yeah, yeah. They'll be obsolete. I mean, just everything from two years ago is obsolete now. And yeah. so, yeah, wait. Do the do avionics last. Last. last? That's the yeah. last thing to do. Yeah. And the engine is next to last. And the engine, probably, if you ordered it now, you wouldn't see it for a couple of years, given all the <laughs> that supply may be issues. True. So <laughs> you might you might want to just wait on that. And don't I'm, be afraid I'm hoping to they go. work that out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And and I mean, I personally wouldn't hesitate putting uh, a used overhaul engine yeah. in. Yeah. You, know, you don't have to go new. Absolutely. So that opens up your window of, you know, potential. But sources. we're we're having a lot of supply chain problems, even overhauling engines yeah. now, yeah. Uh, yeah. just getting the parts that are required to do that. So, but two you years. Know, the, the, the hope is by the time you need an engine, the supply chain situation will be a lot better than it is now. Yeah, you could be on the hunt for a used engine, maybe from the salvage yards or something, and buy it for hopefully not much, and then spend time gathering cheap parts, new replacement parts, and have an overhaul done on that engine. Right. right. Um, you know, because you've got time. I, I know you're going to have it finished in the spring, but <laughs> the, the, the truth is it, it will be in the spring, just not next year. Not next year. <laughs> you know, it's, it's when you open the box, it's 90% complete and only 90% to yeah. go. Yeah. So um, I, I am getting the quick build wings and quick build fuselage. My dad convinced me to go that route yeah. to, uh, no, he said, I had a family, so yep. <laughs> save yep. yourself the time and spend the extra money. Yeah, you want this airplane done before the daughter is ready to solo. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> wow. Well, wow. it sounds like a great journey. Enjoy it. You know, try yeah. not to just get fixated on got to get it finished. Enjoy the uh, the build process because it's something I always wanted to do and probably will never do it now. Yeah. Your daughter will love, I think, to learn how to set rivets. My, yeah. my daughter, Lydia, uh, bucked some rivets and uh, did some stuff when we were doing the wings. And she still talks about that today. She had a good right. time. Awesome. And we're doing, we're doing the practice kit right now. And it's been fun. I thought, so. I thought it was all pull rivets in, on an RV. <laughs> oh, no. No, not on the 10s and 6s yeah. and 7s. Those are all solid rivet yeah. airplanes. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the RV-12 yeah and I the 14 one. i don't keep up with those very much but i think those are all pop rivets yeah you got to drive the rivets on the the earlier rvs for certain i get the benefit of everything being final sized at least i don't oh. have to oh yeah clico it together yep i do it pretty much deburr clico it together and have at it so yeah that's exciting well it's, cool. it's a Great questions, Greg. And I think anybody who's building or considering building experimental will find that an interesting discussion. So we appreciate the question. Thanks for calling. Yeah. Thanks good for call. having me on. Appreciate and it, guys. Good luck. Good Thanks, luck Greg. Thank you. You guys are awesome. Appreciate all you do. Thank you. Our next question is from Alex, who's curious about testing fuel flow on the ground. Go ahead, Alex. Hey, Paul. Hey, Colleen. Hi, Mike. Um, Hi. Hey. Again, just like the last... Uh, caller i just want to say uh thank you for all you do i've learned a whole lot and i appreciate the podcast a long time listener um oh, so uh, it's aviation is one of those things where once you think you have like a little handle on it um <laughs> you realize you don't okay you realize you really don't that's you just pretend we, you do right we, we've no yeah that's what we're doing we're pretending that we have a yeah, handle on it and yeah and you guys have more of a handle than i do, all you people yeah. believe us so we're yeah. okay with that yeah it's fine um so i you know i i'm 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 right at the end of my commercial, and I, I, I was talking to a student on a ramp. Well, I mean, he just came up. He had a question about his fuel and his wing and, and things like that on the ramp of my home airport. Um, I fly out of New Jersey. I fly around the Big Apple Bravos, and I'm part of a um, probably the best club in New Jersey. And we've got um, three planes. We have a steam gauge DA-40, uh, circa 2003. We have a glass 182 which is what I take the family in for like East coast trips. We just came back from Niagara. It was a great trip. Nice. Um, and so the student was asking about fuel and just what to do. And you know, th this person was just starting their journey. You know, they had two or three hours logged of, I have no idea what I'm doing time. <laughs> and 
you know, it's great. It was totally great. And I was happy to be enthusiastic about it. However, he, he was telling me, he's like, you know, I noticed in the uh, diamond, you know, it has left and right, but it doesn't have both like his high wing, you know, Cessna, his 172 that he, he's training in. And he says, well, what do you do to test it on the ground? And I said, oh, I said for the diamond, I think the POH has you run it to 1500 RPMs um, and test it left and right for that. Mm -hmm. But other planes, you don't do that. You just like on your high wing, you just leave it on both. And I think that's the general thing I've been taught. Um, even when you switch it from left to right, if you're going to do that, um, they generally say, just leave it on both. Just turn it when you're going to park, just in case there's an imbalance, mm -hmm. you know, if you're on a hill or something like that. And he got extremely excited and told me no 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 me and my cfi when we were on the ground we test both that way you know that both are working and i said you you do how do you do that and he said well we run it up and you know left and then both then right then back and you know we do that every time and you should do that too and i looked at him and i said okay i i'll i'll look at that and I'll then I went back to the consideration. I would tell you, I went back to the POH, <laughs> looked at the, you know, highly accurate 1970s diagram of the fuel system <laughs> and thought, well, okay, this thing's gravity fed, you know, it's left and right. I think that goes to just the fuel reservoir. <laughs> so if his CFI him are doing that, I don't know what they're testing. <laughs> um, with that said, though, um, I know some other substances I've flown like pipers and so forth. There seems to be some fuel systems where testing it on the ground is a viable thing to do. Like you, you can do it. Where other ones, even the diamond, I looked at the fuel diagram that, that I was able to find online and it wasn't clear to me exactly why they have you run it up to 1500 other than maybe to maintain fuel pressure, you know, so there's no local, you're not sucking in air just in case one is, is, is empty. That, that, that's the general gist I got out of it. But I was just wondering um, from you guys, what can you do to test? What is the general guidelines for testing? I guess two, two parts. One is, what do you do on the ground, if anything? Um, and how do you determine that? And two, also in the air when I switch, one thing that I've been doing with the diamond is I'll switch. There's a 10, 10 uh, gallon you know, delta that the POH says you want to maintain for balance. Mm -hmm. And I just switch it. One thing I don't do, which I realize, uh, you know, like I said, you learn stuff, is I don't put the fuel pump on. And mm -hmm. I should put, apparently I should put the fuel pump on change it and then turn it off. Um, I've never had a problem, thankfully, but I was just curious, what are some of the guidelines, I guess, on the ground and in the air, all pilots should know about um, in terms of the both left and right, you know, game. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, sort of. I, I, I frankly never heard of anybody try to test left and right <laughs> on the ground in a, in a Cessna, but yeah. I think more significantly, I don't think I've ever heard of a Cessna that didn't that only fed from one side <laughs> right. that's a, that's oh. a, that's a difficult thing uh, to do in a gravity fed system um hmm. and you know even we, we do we we do run, occasionally run into a, a Cessna that 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 has a, a vent plugged or something but the uh, the the high wing Cessnas have their, their tanks cross vented from one to another so even if just one tank is vented, you know, the, the, the other one is, is going to get vented through the vent interconnect. Um, mm. And the Cessna 182 has a particularly simple fuel system. It doesn't have header tanks or anything like that the way, say, a 210 might have. So um, I, I think it's kind of a waste of time. I think it's dangerous to be, well, dangerous, uh, ill-advised to be moving the fuel selector in the run-up. I like to leave it uh, on one setting that allowed me to taxi out and do my run-up uh, before I take off. I think my POH says that too, to just leave it and not change it last minute, like right yeah, before so, takeoff. <clears throat> yeah. like that would be on both, right? That would be on yeah. both. And, and for me, it's on both. Yes. Yeah. If you, yeah. Yeah, if you have a both, I agree with, with Mike and Colleen. I don't ever mess with the fuel selector on the ground for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is if you have a carbureted engine, like on a 172 or even a, a 182, not the restarts, but the legacies, um, the fuel bowl on the carburetor holds about 20 to 25 seconds of fuel at full power. Hmm. So if you're doing your ground run up and you switch from one tank to the other tank, you're not going to do that long enough to ever see if you have an interruption in fuel flow or contaminated fuel. Right. You're just not on the ground long enough doing it. I would suggest 
whatever fuel tank you start with when the engine starts, leave it on that. Once you're airborne and you're over an airport, <clears throat> key, key piece of information there. When you're over some other airport on your journey, make that first switch. My dad taught me uh, we would take off on one tank. And when we got to the first nearby airport on our cross-country trip, we would switch to the opposite tank. This might be five minutes into the flight or 10 minutes. And that way, if there was a problem on that other tank, you still had lots of fuel left in the first tank to switch back to and go back home, land at some other airport. But yeah, switching tanks on the ground right before takeoff, I do not do that. Yeah. Because if I start on the right tank and everything's good, and just before takeoff, I switch to the left, if there's a problem, it may show up 200 feet after rotation. That's just not where you want or that to happen. Or you could even but, leave it possibly between the detents and, and be in. Oh, sure. Yeah, you could yeah. come into that situation. Yeah, but Paul, you, you kind of morphed into a discussion of airplanes that don't have a both position. Uh, we, yeah. I thought we started off here talking about the 182 that has a both position. But the right. diamond, I, I've it, got about 4,000 hours in Cessna 182s, and I don't think I have ever had that fuel selector in anything but the both position. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's what I've been no, told. I, I've been told I, I, that's pretty I, much fact, like the 11th fact, commandment I, I, I never, or something like that. I never really understood why Cessna yeah. had a left and a right. Right. I, oh. I learned to fly in a Cessna 150 that, that, that on only has a both position because right. all the, <laughs> all it has is an on off. Yeah. The fuel selector says right. on and off. Mm -hmm. well, and you don't have any choice. You're always flying in both. And, I use uh, left and right to even my fuel load out sometimes. Well, you also have an airplane that will drain completely out of yeah. whichever tank you select. A 182 yeah. doesn't do that. Okay. You have it on both and the left tank, well, it drains out of both. Mm -hmm. But the fuel that's taken from the right tank, instead of getting replenished with air from the vent that's on the left side, gets replenished with fuel that pushes through the vent line from the left side to the right. So you if, get if this the tanks huge. Are, if the tanks are full enough, yeah. Yeah, you get this huge imbalance. Yeah, I mean, if it's on both, that's great. What you don't know if you're on both is if there's something impeding flow from one of the two tanks. Right. You eventually find out because you'll be draining from one tank and not the other. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, if I had a both position, I would probably do that. But the Cirrus, the Columbia's, um, the, the two lenses. tens up until mm -hmm. 83 did not have a both position. Yeah. And, um, so yeah, but if I had both, both is a great place to be most all the time. Is there a reason that the diamond, the DA 40, let's go back to the non both because that's, I think what Mike pointed out. And that's interesting. Cause like the POH and the diamond has you run it up to 1500 RPMs, I think for a minute and switch it left and right. Um, I'll be honest with you, I, I actually don't do that. <laughs> I've been always no. told again to leave it alone, but I, well, I don't that's, know the that's, diamond, that's, an, that's, an in, that's an injected engine, so okay, so, it'll so respond it's... pretty quickly, yeah, yeah. But that's that's interesting, yeah. I've yeah. never seen a POH that asks you to do it uh, in flying the Lancer Legacy. We don't switch tanks on the ground at all, we just need it on one because. Yeah, I mean, I want to know that tank's going to work when I take off. So I'm right. not going to change that until I'm in the air and, and at Over an, an airport. <laughs> Over <laughs> an airport, yeah. <laughs> now, why do some POHs, have, I guess it's the nature of the fuel system, but some POHs allow you to switch from left and right without even touching the fuel pump, right? There are some Sounds that, the but then there's some that absolutely say you should put the fuel pump on before you swap them. Yeah, that's that's new to me. In the legacy, we don't turn the fuel pump on to switch tanks. Because um, you have a Continental. Well, no, you have a Lycoming. I have in a yours, Lycoming. Right? Yeah, yeah. If you have the in your Lycoming engines, fuel injected, you mm -hmm. have the the fuel servo, and you can turn on the pump, and it doesn't change the delivery to the engine. It only ensures, helps eliminate air. So va vapor, yeah. yeah. vapor suppression. Vapor yeah. suppression. The two ten has a low. Um, position on the pump. The Cirrus has a boost pump. Um, some of the others have pumps, but if you use the wrong pump, you can overwhelm the engine, especially on a Continental mm -hmm. with too much fuel, and then and that's really bad. So it, it totally depends on the engine. If the POH says turn on the pump, I would. If it says don't turn on the pump, I wouldn't. 
And Alex, I will say, I'm really impressed that you're studying the uh, fuel delivery diagrams on your individual engine types. So that's, that's pretty good. I, I don't, I don't think they're a little geeky. <laughs> I don't think there are any POHs that say don't turn on the pump. They, they just are silent if they don't. Yeah. Yeah, turn uh, Mike, that is right, Mike. There's no warning that says, you know, if you turn on the pump, your the pump, engine you're will gonna die. You're right. going to flood it. Yeah. You're not going to be able to turn it off. Make sure your power off 180s are, 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 are A+. Plus. No, it, but, but, you'll but there find are out some real that quick. don't mention it at all. Some of them if, don't mention it at all. If you turned it on, it'll let you know real quick. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So yeah, that's right, Colleen. If you look at the fuel diagrams in some of these POHs, they're kind of funny. I, I mean, it's yeah. like my son grew, drew them. <laughs> no, but uh, at least you're thinking, you're thinking about the implications by looking at the, the engineering, whatever you have, you know, that's, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was just, I just trying to do something. I, I might be doing something wrong. Like with the DA 40, I've swapped the pumps, swapped the sides, excuse me, without turning on the pump. I have done mm -hmm. that. And mm -hmm. I realized, well, maybe I should actually turn on that fuel pump before I swap them just because it's safer. I've, like I said, I've never had even a peep of a problem. I mean, nothing. But you do watch the fuel flow and fuel pressure in this process, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. That's what I'm looking. Right. Yes. Yes. My eyes are stared to the right because I'm looking yeah. at those gauges in the dime, right? The, I forgot what you call it, but the, the engine readout system uh, that's over there. Yeah, I'm yeah. staring at it for fuel okay. pressure. Right. I am doing that, but I should probably put that pump on. And I did learn something from that student with like a couple hours. So that was good. Watch out. Those students are dangerous. Oh, man, they're real <laughs> bad about reading the book. They fill their heads with stuff. And then you hear all this interesting stuff. Some is good and some not so good. <laughs> yeah, it's know. funny. For, when the, I, oh, for, the 182, well, for the 182, I think you should just placard the left and right positions to say, do not use and leave it at that. In off. <laughs> in off. Left tank in is in off. off. The right F, the right tank is in off. But the both tank is good. Yes. Mm -hmm. I like yes. the both I, tank. By the way, I want to say something, and I and I think all of three of you have had to have this experience, especially you, Colleen, because I did my instrument in a 177B. Okay. Um, it is very hard for me to watch a Cessna on both where one side is going towards E. It's <laughs> really hard sometimes yeah. to see that. And then you see it level out just as Paul, you know, you know it'll yeah, drain a little bit. bit and it'll level out. But you got to get used to it because the first time it happened, I was just aching to turn <laughs> that switch. Well, like, oh, come on. It's a, it's a very bizarre fuel system design that they, that they had, you know. The, the, yeah, the, the, venting, just... the venting is highly asymmetrical. And why they did it that way, I don't know. Right, was, yeah. yeah. Save yeah. three ounces or something. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> right. Yep. Been there. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, very cool. Yeah. Thanks a lot, guys. Alex, yeah. Thanks for thanks for coming on. It's a great question. Yeah. No, it makes you think. think over, overthink. <laughs> yeah, overthink. totally overthink. <laughs> Probably yep. a little overthinking, but you know, once you've done it, just remember you don't have to think about it anymore. Yeah. We we're <laughs> we're all card carrying members of over, overthinkers anonymous anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I've read Mike's book. I, I, I can attest to that. Which one? <laughs> I think most of them, actually. Good, good. Well, cool. Well, well, we really get into overthink overdrive when the three of us are just, you know, sitting around in Oshkosh chit-chatting. Yeah. Because it's all the same conversation that we have here, but it's between the three of us. It gets, yeah. Were we talking about getting in the weeds? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're weed, weed cutters. Yeah. Weed whackers. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, great question. Well, yep. Thanks, Alex. Super thanks, cool. Alex. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Our next question is from Ernest, who thinks he hears a knock, knock, knock at the door. Go ahead, Ernest. <laughs> Hi, all. I'm a big fan of uh, your work, and uh, Mike, I listen to every uh, podcast uh, on EA. It's actually kind of my badge of honor to be able to say that I've got them all checked out for the list. So <laughs> thanks for everything you do. All, all 150 of them. Huh? <laughs> Pretty much, pretty much, and probably a few of them twice. <laughs> hey, Ernest, get a life. <laughs> wow. You are absolutely correct. I'm trying to become an ENP now. So. Oh, excellent. Oh, congratulations. That's, That's great. wonderful. You. <laughs> when you're ready for a job in the real world of GAA aviation, give me yeah. a call. Paul will hire you in a heartbeat. You have to move to Tennessee, though. So yeah, no, that's no that's a good thing. That. Yeah, yeah, but absolutely. it's it's Western Tennessee, so it's okay. that's right. We're Flatlanders. <laughs> absolutely. Good stuff. Uh, yeah, well, from the video, um, we'll probably be able to hear it a bit there, but uh, I got this 172 on floats with the um, 
0360 A18 with the uh, variable pitch. And uh, I've had the plane for four years, so actually four annuals. And um, that's how I count them. Um, and I um, at, at so about, what is that? A hundred, hundred eighty horsepower? Yeah, yeah the, yeah. the one eighty. Okay, because yeah. I was thinking a one seventy two on floats would be a little underpowered, but <laughs> with that little. engine, it's probably okay. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I find it uh, pr pretty nice and good climb rate even with the, with that propeller. So um, the, uh, the the one thing that got me uh, kind of uh, thinking for a while. Uh, and I put it behind me now, I guess, but since we're here, uh, the uh, one of the ANPs at some point said down idle, you could hear a knock. Uh, and, and, and it was kind of there for me too. But uh, after he mentioned it, then I became really, really aware of that. You and, can't uh, unhear it. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, so we had a couple little things uh, tweaked uh, after that. And I, I, I don't say that it's still there that much, but um, maybe... Uh, interesting to see what you guys think from the, the video if you can hear it as well well you could you couldn't hear it inside the cockpit only outside uh with, with the headsets on I, I could never really hear it um it was really like uh, idling the plane and like walking around the plane uh, being on floats once it's on the ground it's kind of easy to do you'll hear it towards the end i should have added that video but i think right around there those are the flaps oh that's there yeah a little clack yeah yeah that's sounds that's, like a lifter that's, that's lifter Lifters, yeah. lifter yeah. clatter that's what i figured it had to be because he said a knock mm. would sort of you know these most people equate knock with with a with detonation kind of thing but in cars right yeah you can't really hear that in an airplane but yeah that's that's lifter clatter so okay how, do, how does he fix that isn't is it def partially deflated well, uh, lifter? Um, I, my recommendation is to is to look left and look right and make sure there's nobody in either direction and then pour some Marvel <laughs> mystery oil into the engine. Oh my God! Not Marvels. I no. can't believe I heard that. Yeah. And add a bottle of champagne Ian, while you're can, at it. Can, can we delete that? We need to mute that. Nice. That's that, that's Unreal. the only thing that I know of that Marvel mystery oil actually has is is got is is good for is eliminating lifter clatter. Don't keep well, using it. Just use it enough to eliminate the problem. Describe the mechanism, Mike. What's sticking or clogged up? The lifter. The well, lifter uh, uh, it, mean, it would mean a lifter isn't pumping up completely. Yeah. Okay. And and, so, and so there's there's some free play in the in 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 the uh, in the valve train, which there shouldn't be. The lifter is supposed to pump up and eliminate any of the free play. Well, couldn't so, you take each individual lifter out and sure. oh, this, yeah, yes, and you, then you, clean you, it? Yeah, you could. You could. That's it, a lot of work. I, 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 I would throw the Marvel mystery oil in first, and if that doesn't work, then go to Colleen's Plan B. Because yeah. yeah, there are eight lifters, right? So it's kind of like which well, one? Take right. And and in in Lycoming, you can't you can't remove the tappets, but you can remove the lifter bodies right. and yep. right. clean them and stuff, put them back. So another thing, a, a question. Uh, so the videos of a landing, I assume that's after a flight. The oil's hot. And at idle, the oil pressure is very low if the oil's hot. Does the same thing happen when the oil is cold and you're at idle? When you first start the engine, do you have the same? It's Let's don't say knock. We can call it a click. Clack. Click or a click, click or a clack. I like that. Or, or a clunk. <laughs> or a clunk, yeah. But it's not a knock. If you say knock, right. you can it go straight to something totally different like Mike was saying. Yeah. Absolutely. But, uh, yeah. I, I, Go ahead. Is is it happening when the oil is cold and you're at idle? Um, I um, uh, I couldn't tell. Now that okay. I, I have a name for it, click. I'll be definitely <laughs> listening for that right. specifically and, and be able and, to. Uh, and it sounds to me it. like it's only it's it's probably only one lifter that's doing that. Yeah. So mm -hmm. From the frequency of it, it's pretty mm -hmm. pretty low frequency. Could he figure out which lifter it is by looking at um what what is it called when the um look at the, the valve high the push rod yeah lift yeah well I, I I would think it you could probably localize it quite a bit if 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 you idled the engine with the top cowling off use the stethoscope yeah. yeah figure out where the noise is where, where it's coming from mm -hmm. wonderful. It, 
The thing is, as soon as you get it up to power at all, where the oil pressure comes up higher, yeah, it goes away. It may go away and the lifter may be fine. It may only happen when you're at, at low RPM or more correctly, low oil pressure. Right. So I would ensure that in cruise at normal oil temperatures, about 180 degrees and cruise RPM, that you want to have your oil pressure set oh, around 80 PSI, something right around there. And if your oil pressure is running maybe at 60 or 65, just running it up to 80 at cruise, that you may find that resolves the problem as well. Excellent. Does, does, this, does this issue um, cause any damage by slapping of the lifter against the push rod? Is it something that he should worry about or is it just annoying sound? I'm glad you're mentioning that because um, that was my, the, the next thing that I, I had in line with. Um, I did get an oil analysis once and I, I've got a, a second one scheduled and uh, everything seemed fairly uh, good except maybe chrome was a little bit higher. So I didn't know if there was any chrome parts uh, in that area or is that just... There's, there's no chrome in the valve train mm -hmm. other than on the valve stems themselves. Yeah, so that's not an issue. I... Super. Fantastic. Oh. Yeah, I, I have two questions for Ernest. The first question is, where exactly was that lake that we saw in the video? Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. That's uh, actually about uh, six hours west from where I am. I'm in uh, near Montreal, Quebec. Uh, ah. and I bought the plane in, uh, on, in Rimouski. So it's a really small lake uh, off the, uh, the St. Lawrence. Thank wow. you. And this, my second question is, can, can I come fly that? <laughs> yes. Fly, fly and float plane the most fun i think absolutely in aviation yeah next winter mike you can go visit him in february oh then we have to do it on, <laughs> we, we have to do it on skis then do you, do you put skis on the airplane in the winter <laughs> uh no actually i migrate uh, to the west coast for the winter uh, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. wow but, yeah, I, I, I got my float plane rating some some years back and uh, all my all my times in super cups just about but it's it's so much fun oh my goodness I'll oh, probably be uh, in Port Angeles this winter, so if uh, if anything, and we always try to go out to the to the float plane base at Oshkosh when we're there too. Nice place is, is the only peaceful it's part right. of their adventure. <laughs> yeah, wait, we weren't supposed to tell anybody that. You know no, what it's going it. to be like next year? It's going to be crowded, and noisy, and now it's fun. Absolutely. Well, loved seeing the video. Really interesting question, and yeah. I think we answered it, which is. Yeah. <laughs> One in a row. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for Thank calling you so in. Much. It was Thanks, great Ernest. talking with you. Take yeah, care. Thanks Thank for you. the call, Ernest. Bye. Our next question is from Via Cheslov. I hope I got that right. He wants to learn more about his valve springs. Go ahead. Notice I only said his name once because that's <laughs> just not going to try it a second time. You couldn't say it the same way twice. That's why. Via, via Cheslov. Yep. Yeah. Excellent. Oh, you're getting a hang of it. Not yeah. bad. <laughs> Thanks so much for taking my call. Really, really love your show. I listen to it religiously. Thank you. Glad you're on. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, I um, uh, happen to be an aviation nut, uh, like many of your <laughs> Join listeners. Join the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I own two airplanes, actually. Uh, both of them are what Paul calls vintage airplanes. <laughs> 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 so one of them is... Um, 1954 Bonanza 35E, and the other is uh, 1960 uh, Cessna 172. That's my was my first plane. That's when, <laughs> when I learned on it. And so, we, my question is: uh, We hear so much about um, uh, you know uh, exhaust valves developing hot springs, hot hot spots um, because of the uh, rotator spring failures right so like in, in rotators the spring kind of flattens out or wears out and you know the valves stop rotating and uh on both of my planes it they seem to be the, they equipped with equally vintage engines <laughs> and uh, so one of them is uh, continental o 300 the other is uh, continental e225 and doesn't seem to have um you know the rotators doesn't doesn't have the springs so my question is you know seems like valves should rotate there as well and 
If so, how do they rotate? I don't know that the O300, I mean, there's no rotator, uh, rotocoils in the O300. I'm not sure about the 225. Um, yeah, so I, I looked at the illustrated parts catalog and doesn't doesn't seem to just have yeah. these little keepers that uh, right. hold, uh, you know, hold the, the spring container, that's it. Um, I don't know that they rotate or has anything to cause them to rotate. I do agree yeah, that I, they should. I think that's one of the few that doesn't rotate. I think mm -hmm. I remember Mike pointing out that there's a couple odd ones that don't rotate. Most of them have something mechanism to make them rotate. Is that correct, Mike? As far as far as I know, yeah. I, I yeah. think the the O two hundred O three hundreds don't don't have uh, rotor coils or, or rotator caps. So how do you prevent them from burning? Like well, you don't unleaded you don't. unleaded av gas. That's no, that would help probably. <laughs> yeah. But um, are you having trouble with burn valves? Not really. One one of the valves is actually like it looks like it's developing some asymmetricity. Like it, mm -hmm. uh, when they when they stick a boroscope inside, it seems like there is there is a bit of a kind of starting yeah. you know, start of that. Like it would. Um, maybe taking out the springs and, you know, maybe like doing preventative, um, lapping the valves, lapping the valves, for example. Yeah. But I mean, particularly if, if you see a lot of deposits <clears throat> building up on the, on the seats and so on, when you bore scope the cylinders, it probably it wouldn't hurt from time to time to, to do a little, a little lapping in place to, to clean everything off. Is there data to support that these engines uh, suffer from burn valves more than any other type of engine? I'm, I'm not really that. aware of that. I know I know mm -hmm. the 0200s, no 300s are the uh, uh, suffer from from sticking valves, which the larger Continentals tend not <clears> to do. <throat> um, but the, you know they're they're low compression engines. They were certified uh, on 80 octane fuel. Um, so the combustion temperatures are, are lower and probably the valves aren't quite as stressed out as they are in, in, in higher compression, uh, continental engines. Hmm. But yeah, as far as I know, there's no rotating mechanism on those valves. Hmm. You just happen to have the two engines that don't have <laughs> rotators out of all yeah. the engines available. <laughs> yeah. Of Michael. all the planes in the world, you had to choose. Hmm. That's so where where are you calling from? Where's where's base? Oh, so I live in Berkeley, California. Oh, okay. Uh, and, well, here uh, I'm sitting, I'm looking at your name and trying to mispronounce it and pronounce it, and I'm just assuming <laughs> that you're in the Czech Republic or somewhere. <laughs> you know. oh, uh, originally, I'm from Belarus. I know. Oh, people. Belarus. Ah, okay. Belarus. Okay. <clears throat> wow. Um, yeah, I've been living in the U.S. I really enjoy how free aviation in, uh, <laughs> yeah. in the U.S. And, where, do you, where do you base the airplanes? At Oakland or something? In, or in Hayward? Concord. Uh, in oh, Concord. Concord. Uh -huh. Oh, Concord, yeah. Great airport. Yeah. Did you fly in Belarus? Not really, no. No, oh, I really? picked it up here. Hmm. Not many people fly in Belarus. Well, <laughs> Things are really expensive. Serious. I'll bet, I'll bet it yeah, is. That's yeah. right. Mm. Wow. Yeah, I went in so far that I got a helicopter kit now. And then oh, oh my goodness! What, what you kind have, of which you one? have been bit hard? Yeah, like a rotorway <laughs> or something? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's oh. a rotorway. Uh, a That's great. Oh my! Oh, that'll be fun. Yeah. I have to go look at those every year at Oshkosh. I just kind of mm -hmm. stare at them for a little while and realize Helen would never let me have one. So <laughs> I, I think it's a the perfect commuter plane. You know, my my twenty yeah. minute drive to work every day could be cut down to. I don't know, 10, Nothing. maybe yeah. five. And your neighbors will love you. They will love me at seven <laughs> o'clock in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the worst part of that is most of my neighbors are related, so they wouldn't hesitate to let yeah, me know. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, it's, it's, it's almost finished. I'm hoping actually maybe that's a path to AMP as well. Uh, like if I finish the kit and um, there'll be enough hours to... Um, yeah, you should be, all all those hours that you spend doing that ought to ought to count towards the experience requirements. Yeah. Well, with uh, two legacy airplanes 
and something with rotor wings, you will need your AMP. Yeah. So yeah. That's, exactly. You're going to be spending a lot of time working on those airplanes. Yeah, you'll save yeah, yourself some it. money and, and learn a lot from maintaining all three. That would be great. Well, there, there is a, quite a bit of um, help kind of I'm getting from the local MPs who are mm -hmm. okay. usually, um, you know, old folks. Like there isn't mm -hmm. that many uh, kind of young guys, unfortunately, there. But um, uh, yeah, right now it's, it's, it's somewhat easy to find somebody who would supervise your work and teach you and... Help you maintain. That's been my experience. Um, it's the older guys that you know they're they're not going to be around forever, and I almost feel like I'm a steward of keeping their information and trying to pass it on to other people. Yeah, absolutely. And this podcast and Mike, your books and everything like is is a great service for the community. Thank you again for doing that. Well, we appreciate you participating in our in our podcast. Yeah, thanks for the, the question. Yep. And Let making Chesnoff. Paul pronounce your name. But <laughs> chest, but dang it, I lost it. Yeah, the Slav. Slav. Oh, yeah. No, I'm, I feel like I'm insulting, the... no, no, I'm no, no, no. I'm insulting you and I'm not trying to. I promise. There's four that's syllables the there. No, yeah, it's, it's no, it's three syllables the way he has it written on a screen. The okay. Chet Slav. Well, the but chase no, love. No, notice it's no? it's it chest love K, and he's not telling us what the K stands for. That's oh, yeah. probably even well, more unpronounceable, right? <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it is equally <laughs> unpronounceable. I assure you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, th th there is this uh, Soviet actor that my mom really liked, um, ah. yeah, and so she named me after him. I think ah. that's, that's the story. Okay, <laughs> and she's sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, well. <laughs> I have to, I guess. Well, well it's great, great to have you on the podcast. Oh, yep, it was nice to you meet so you. Good luck with that helicopter. Thank you. Sounds like fun. Good. Okay. Our next question is from Nigel, who wants to get deep into condition-based maintenance. Go ahead, Nigel. Yay. Hello, everybody. Um, I, have, I have a turbo-normalized conversion Bonanza. Uh, motor has about 1,900 hours on it. Uh, the accessories, turbo, uh, wastegate actuator, wastegate controller, have the same amount of time on them. Um, obviously, mags and things like that, we, we do the, the, the normal service intervals. And I'm wondering about condition monitoring on turbocharger system components and what you might consider to be useful ways of doing that. Um, the prop also had about Actually, there were 2,000 hours on it, and I made a fact-free decision a few weeks ago to have it overhauled. <laughs> fact-free, I love that. For no, for, for no very good basis, no, uh, but just because you, it you was should... X years old and had 2,000 hours on it. You um, should have come on the podcast first so we could talk you out of it. That was a, <laughs> that was a very expensive mistake in timing. <laughs> well, it's interesting. No, nobody will do an IRAM on a 24-year-old that, that, prop right. that's uh, never had that, any maintenance. Yeah. So. That's right. That's so, right, but, but it didn't need any. Um, so let, let, I think you're probably right. Yes, <laughs> let's let's talk about the prop first, and then we'll talk about the turbo system. Okay, sure. Um, and I guess what I have to say about props, and and hopefully there are no prop shop employees listening to this podcast because they will be violently in a, a opposition. But I have been a NTSB accident report junkie for about five decades. I read dozens of NTSB accident reports literally every week. I subscribe to a publication called the NTSB Reporter and I just, and in, in five decades, I have yet to read an accident report where the probable cause was related to a, a high time propeller. Um, the, you know, the, the, it's not to say that props can go forever, but in my view, if, if they're not leaking and they're regulating RPM properly, just leave them alone, you know, yeah. no. now prop shops don't agree with that. And, <clears throat> uh, you know, my experience is the same as yours. I, I had a um, a, a kind of an engine failure back in 2014. I was flying to Oshkosh and 
one of my pistons decided to shed half of the piston skirt into the engine while I was over flying Las Vegas and uh, fill, filled the engine full of aluminum marble sized little pieces of aluminum after that piston skirt tangled with the, the crankshaft and lost. And, um, and, and, and actually Paul and I got that airplane put back into service <laughs> in a, in a very <laughs> memorable experience that yeah. neither of us will ever forget. <laughs> but, but I remember one, one thing that happened was that, that, um, it, you know, the prop obviously came off when the engine got sent out for overhaul and, um, so I called the local prop shop in Las Vegas who will remain lameless. And I said, could you do a clean and flush on my, on my propeller and my prop governor? And they said, how much time is on them? And I told them and they said, no, we won't do anything but a full overhaul. Hmm. And I said, well, thanks, but no thanks. And I poured a bunch of Stoddard solvent into the prop and I put it back on the engine because because <laughs> they wouldn't they wouldn't help me out. So that I, I've had exactly the same experience as you. But uh, I you know I, propeller problems are, are, are not something that that cause accidents. And in, in, in my considered opinion, after reading thousands of NTSP accident reports over the years, and so if, if the prop is, like I say, if it's not leaking and it's, and it's regulating RPM properly and it doesn't have any, you know, major gashes on the blades that, that where you worry about fatigue fractures or something, I would just, I would just keep on trucking with it. No, I think that's probably very good advice, but I didn't take it. <laughs> yes. So anyway, let's talk about the turbo system. Um, and, and basically there are, there are three major components to the turbo system. There's yep. there's the wastegate assembly, there's the controller, and there's the turbocharger itself. Um, controllers almost never fail. They, they they the only time I've ever had problems with controllers is is when they got um, fod in them, and uh, the solution has always been to blow them out with shop air, and then they work again. <laughs> so, uh, wastegates are, are, are fairly problematic, um, and they they live a very difficult life. They're, they're sitting there at, at some ungodly amount of temperature and getting all contaminated with exhaust deposits and stuff. And so eventually they'll start sticking, and you'll you'll no, notice that because you you know your manifold pressure regulation will will, will be erratic. And then you um, you saturate them with with uh, mouse milk, and if that doesn't solve the problem, you send them out uh, to to uh, to be overhauled. The turbocharger um, also has a, a a limited life, but it, they're they're pretty easy to inspect, and we do this at every annual inspection. The main thing you want to do is you you want to take the tailpipe off and take the the uh, the induction stuff off so you have access to both sides of the turbocharger and then grab both ends of the shaft and, and, and wiggle. And uh, there should not be any wiggle in the axial direction. Um, or I, I said that wrong, in the radial, radial. direction. Yeah. There, there should be a little bit of wiggle in the axial direction, but not any in the radial direction. And then the other thing you look for is you look for um, any evidence of, of um, blade scrape because if a turbocharger stays in service long enough, the 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 veins of the turbine wheel stretch and uh, eventually they'll start rubbing against the turbine housing. So you look for that. And then you also look for for cracks in the uh, in the flange where the tailpipe attaches. And um, that's just something that, that we always do on an annual inspection of a of, of a turbocharged airplane. My shop, um, uh, there's a well-known uh, Bonanza shop in Michigan. Um, we, as, as you say, in the, in the annuals, we, we can look at the compressor side, we can look at the turbine, so we can do that with bore scopes. Um, it's very, unless you do a significant amount of disassembly, uh, as you probably know, the turbo normalized Bonanzas are extremely densely packaged. <laughs> yes. Uh, to, um, to get into the top of the turbine, in other words, the inlet side from the exhaust manifold, 
is really difficult. Um, but you essentially take the whole turbo system apart to get there. And uh, so uh, inspecting that part is is perhaps the most difficult part. But certainly looking looking at both sides with the with the bore scope and checking for axial and a little bit of axial play and and, and no radial play uh, is is something we can easily do. And the you're saying that runs. you're saying that it's hard to get to the cold side of the of the turbo. No, no, no. It's no, easy to get to the cold off. side. It's easy okay. to get to the outlet side of the hot right. side because you say you okay. can go you can go up the stub. To get into the top of the turbocharger where the two sides of the exhaust system come together and and where the, the, the hot side is oh. very difficult because you've got to take the thing apart to get there's, in there. There's not much you're gonna see yeah, in there anyway. Yeah. <clears throat> but that's I the, I was told by various people that if you're going to get cracks in the housing, they're more likely to be there on the inlet side than they are on the outlet side. But I, I don't know. <laughs> well, I, and, and that's true. Uh, and and I've I've seen some turbochargers come off of airplanes who, whose owners shall remain nameless. <laughs> but but they but they do a podcast. Um, um, and, uh, and 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 sometimes sometimes. Uh, when the turbo is high time that 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 area looks pretty horrendous but it never seems to have that much effect on the operation yeah. of, the, yeah. of, of the turbocharger the, so the, the the main problems that i've seen are are um are blade scrape um and uh, and cracks in the in the flange where the where yeah. the tailpipe attaches yeah yeah the, where, the, where the v-band clamp is yeah exactly well i've i've operated two turbo normalized bonanzas out to you know 1800 1900 hours without any turbo system problems at all mm -hmm. um they all get they operated lean at peak all the time which i don't know whether that has any any uh, help for them but um i guess i shall just keep on doing the sort of condition monitoring that you're talking about because that's what we already do and well, well, it continues to get to altitude and it continues to regulate manifold pressure fine, then I shall continue to fly it. Can you can you uh, run a bore scope up and see the wastegate? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you want to inspect that, make yeah. sure it's not warped and that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, I don't know about the turbo normalized bonanza, but almost all other turbos will have a check valve in the oil inlet yeah. and the oil outlet. I would put those on a, it's pretty simple to take them off and inspect. I would put those on a, depending on what kind you have, maybe a thousand hour, just take it apart, make sure it's uh, uh -huh. okay. Cause I've seen so many turbos pulled and sent away because you know, all this blue smoke is coming out of the engine. They, oh, the turbo shot. And the reality, it wasn't the turbo, it was the check valves that were allowing the turbos to fill with oil yeah. while the airplane was sitting on the ground. So, uh, but, but isn't 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 the usual symptom of a of a check valve failure, Paul? That 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 the plane the leaks oil on the ground out of out the tailpipe when it's sitting in the hangar. Well, it can. If it, for instance, if the inlet check valve doesn't close, then you siphon oil into the turbo and it fills yeah. up with oil. And if it sits there long enough, and it leaks bad enough, because the the shaft on the turbo doesn't seal at low temperature doesn't seal great at high temperature, but it's just not made to sit there with oil in it. And so, yeah, it will eventually drip out the tailpipe, but that takes, that's a lot of oil. It may take a half a quart to fill the turbo mm -hmm. until it gets high enough to come out. But the outlet check valve is the one that <clears throat> I also worry about because if it fails, it blocks the oil from returning to the scavenge pump. Yeah. And if that occurs, now you have back pressure and you're yeah. forcing oil out the turbo while you're flying and you don't get to see that mm. you're just pumping it overboard and you have no clue but you have a great smoke trail mm -hmm. you have a great smoke trail and it it won't necessarily show up in the tailpipe i mean you mm. think it would but it's burning i mean that turbo's 15 1600 degrees yeah. and it's burning yeah. that oil it's not going through as a liquid yeah yeah no so that's I, a good idea we we, we don't um routinely well in fact we have not looked at those check valves so that's something to add to the list can yeah, the yeah. Uh, can the inlet check valve uh, fail closed and and starve the turbo of oil? Oh sure, which would yeah. also cause a failure. <laughs> you know, but you would fast. find out about that one pretty quick. <laughs> pretty quick yeah. 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 And yeah. and you're yeah. not you're probably not going to catch that. I mean, that's going to be an odd failure. They don't hmm. do that very often. I, I apologize for the rivet guns going on in the background. I noticed it just, Ian keeps he keeps muting my mic every now and then. So. It just adds authenticity. Paul. <laughs> that's right. 
<laughs> those are long rivet draws, Paul. But those are yeah. some, there's some you know, really the, big long rivets that are being okay. set. There are wow. no uh, there are no check valves in the turbo system on my Cessna 310 because the the turbochargers are high enough. Mm, the, right. the only yeah. time you need check oh, valves yeah. is if the turbocharger is mounted low, uh, where where oil can siphon yeah. down mm. into the turbo. But if the turbocharger is mounted up high relative to the engine, then you don't need the yeah. check valve. So some systems have them, and some systems yeah. don't. The bonanzas do because the turbos are weighed down yeah. by the gill right. plate, so there's nowhere yeah. else to put them. Yeah. Like a two, all the single engine Cessnas are are yeah. mounted down low. Yeah, the yeah. the tur the turbo normalized <laughs> bonanzas are what we call 15 pounds of stuff in a 10 pound sack. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's wow. the clean. That's the clean version. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you need a comprehensive selection of cuss words to work on those airplanes <laughs> because uh, you're. you're your normal short list doesn't work. Right. Yeah, yeah. I'll bet. Okay, but they're great. But they're amazing airplanes. Yeah, they are. Well, say, yeah. I've had two of them and they are great. Well, we love to hear about people thinking about condition monitoring. That's a good thing. Yeah. Yes. So, That's yeah. really good. Great but questions. Just think we, about we, it we, next time before you replace the parts. Right. <laughs> we, we hate to see things like props euthanized when they don't have to be. So. Yeah, well, but pre pretty much all, all my... Uh, Usual suspect says to me, "What are you overhauling the prop for? You don't need to do that." And, I, and I'm not, I'm still not quite sure why I did it. Just it, I, I felt like I needed to do it, which is ridiculous. so. Uh, you did it so that we could pick on you when you came well, on the podcast. That's, that's, that's right. fair enough. That, that, if that's it right. wasn't for you, we wouldn't have anything to talk about. <laughs> and it always seems when I do send my prop in for an IRAN, they oh the bearings need to be replaced. Oh your hub has corrosion. They always find corrosion somewhere, but that corrosion never seemed to impact how my well the the operating. only thing the prop shop said about mine was which I say was 24 years since new zero maintenance. They said there was a little bit of corrosion on the bearing races, but it was so little they could polish it out. So, oh, well, you got <laughs> heaven on. forbid that you went 24 years with no maintenance on that's your propeller. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. It was 24 wow. years, which good is one of the you. reasons I said, well, maybe that, I ought to do something about that's it. That's that's about how long I've gone, Paul. I don't yeah. Know. Well, I know, but I'm. But your your mic in you know my airplane is like your airplane. It's a flying experiment. Exactly. <laughs> but, uh, Don't say that. Yeah. But Nigel here, he's you know he's thinking he's playing by the rules, and he, he went outside of the box here. <laughs> just yeah, just a bit. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think it's the longest I've ever run a prop without anybody looking at it because nothing went wrong with it. I mean, yeah. yeah. And you say, well, well, why did you overhaul it? Good question. Prop shops tend to be very zero tolerance outfits, in my experience, and. Uh, you know the if you can get them to do an iran the 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 end part of iran is set in about 48 point type you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah think the, about um, it <laughs> yeah the, the the shop at the shop i use will do an iran on a prop up to i think they said 12 years old uh, oh. assuming nothing else wrong with it but i was double that so wow well you got wonder, your money's what, worth what would be different i mean it, it let's say 13 years because there's a magical line at 12 somewhere. What is so different at 13 years? Because they're doing an IRAN. They have it open. They can inspect everything. They're just drawing a line. Uh, yeah. They, they say that Macaulay won't let them do it, but I don't know whether oh, that, that's yeah, not that sounds true. like a good yeah. excuse, doesn't it? Yeah. But you know, the, the props warranted for what, 72 months? Well, what happens in 73 months? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Same thing. <laughs> I think you have been reading some books. That's what I think. Yeah. <laughs> you you know, at seventy three months, stuff starts just flying off immediately. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. immediately. the paint comes off, the sticker comes off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it, I, I, it does look nice. I mean, it's oh, shiny. Yeah. <laughs> My they precious. do that for you. Yeah, my precious. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Well, all thank, right thanks Thank Nigel. You. This is fun. yeah yeah good call nigel thank thanks you. guys nice talking to you all, all right, all right. Bye. 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 our next question is from reed who is hoping to draw a lot of conclusions from a little bit of data go ahead reed yeah that's a good way to tee it up uh, uh i co-own a 1971 172l and it's equipped with the instrumentation that most of them were at the time um, it has about 1,800 hours since a uh, major overhaul, and we fly it about 90 hours a year. And I've listened to Mike talk about, you know, ignore that exhaust gas temperature gauge, and I've always been a fan of, of aggressively leaning the, the mixture. And uh, uh, 
about when it had about a thousand hours on it. Uh, discovered during annual zero compression on number three cylinder. It had a nice half moon burned area that exhaust valve. And uh, since then, I've not leaned as aggressively, and uh, uh, I've wondered, uh, you know. Uh, you know, do a lot of six hour nonstop flights in his airplane, and uh, which is kind of crazy, but uh, with nothing else to do but sit there and look at that exhaust gas temperature gauge, I kind of wonder if I'm doing damage to that thing again by leaning ag aggressively. And, and I've also noticed the indicated uh, temperature on the single point uh, gauge continues to uh, increase a little bit year to year. Uh, indicating hotter and hotter on that uh, single point. I've replaced the probe. I've replaced, uh, rebuilt the mags, rebuilt the carburetor. Nothing changes that exhaust gas. Temperature. So uh, that's about my story. So let's, let's yeah, talk, go ahead, Mike. Let's talk about this Alcor gauge that you have. <laughs> Highly um, precise. That's right. Um, it the Alcor gauge. I I actually I never do this. Uh, this is this is what Celine <clears throat> always does. But I actually research this a little bit. <laughs> and I, I, I you're I, rubbing I, off I, on it, Colleen. I, I, I pulled I pulled up up the Alcor documentation. Um, um, almost none of the Alcor gauges were calibrated gauges. They they no. they are gauges that they, they they don't they don't have any temperatures written on this on the scale they they wonderful they, they've got about um 80 of the way up the scale they've got a, an asterisk and um some of them have an adjustable pointer that you can that that, that you can set and, and usually there it's a yellow pointer sometimes it's a red pointer Others don't have the pointer, but what they have is a calibration screw on the front of the instrument. And that and and what the manual instructs you to do is to is to lean the engine to peak EGT at um, at an altitude where you can where you can get 65% power at wide open throttle, and then uh, adjust a little screw so that the, the the gauge reads right on the on the asterisk. What that little screw does is is it turns a little wire wound potentiometer inside the inside the instrument, and so um, my bet is that if 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 you if you are seeing um, monotonically increasing readings on your EGT gauge, it's because that little potentiometer is starting to corrode. <laughs> Uh, and you might want to just recalibrate the gauge following following the the, the Alcor instructions. Does your gauge have have a, have an adjustable pointer on it, or does it just have the scale? It, it the has asterisk? the adjustable red red pointer. And, okay, because because uh, on those again, gauges, uh, then they say they they just put the pointer where peak EGT occurs um, at an altitude, typically six or seven thousand feet, where you can be wide open throttle at 65 percent power and that that's how they recommend calibrating the gauge um but like i say some of them have the movable pointer and some of them have a, a little adjustment screw that turns a a, a a potentiometer but they're not calibrated gauges um and they you know they just they just want you to periodically calibrate it to what the engine is putting out as opposed to trying to use it to somehow measure absolute EGT because that's not what that gauge was, was intended for. And that makes sense because he said he replaced the probe and nothing changed. So that indicates it's the gauge that's the problem. Yeah. Either Mom that or that uh, uh, partially burning uh, valve is letting more exhaust come through and raise. I'm just, you got to make stuff up sometimes. But, the, but, gloom. but we don't have a partially burning valve anymore. No. Oh, that's true. Yeah, after you yeah, did the yeah. valve. What did your mechanic say, Reed? Well, the the probe is not on the valve. I'm um, not on the cylinder. Right. It's a it's a collective. I've three yeah. Burned. Yeah. And um, and my mechanics theory, and he works on a lot of 
flight school 172s is that when when they burn a valve it's not number three because the the scavenge hose that goes down to the cooler is just right at that cylinder that's his yeah. theory of why so I, I, that was my other concern that you're leaning differently because you've had a burn valve and i know people don't always agree with me on this but the reason a valve burns is because it doesn't make contact with the seat. That's when it cools. The way you lean the engine does not burn the valve. Having a cylinder head temperature that's at 390 instead of 360 does not burn the valve. So your cylinder head temperature is not burning the valve. Your leaning process is not burning the valve. What burns the valve is you get deposits under the valve, between the valve and the seat, that cause it not to seat properly so it gets hot in one spot or the valve quits rotating um, it and it, it gets hot in one spot and that's how valves get burned it's not your leaning so go back to your right. standard leaning pull it back till it runs rough enriching it till it runs smooth and you're good to go and your mechanics explanation of the lack of uh, airflow over that cylinder because of the oil cooler is not why the valve burned. It might run right. hotter because of that, but it's the contact between the valve and the valve yeah. seat that dissipates the heat. That has Absolutely. To be perfect. You, you yep. know what is really starting to concern me quite seriously is that so far uh, on on this podcast, I have agreed with everything that Paul says, and that oh, never no. happens. <laughs> I, I I just must be your lucky day, Paul. What a day! <laughs> One in a row. Go to Vegas, baby. Well, since uh, hearing Mike say ignore that exhaust gas temperature for the umpteenth yeah. time, I've gone back to leaning aggressively, taxi good, in, good. and in cruise. And uh, well, just, just but, remember uh, that that Alcor gauge is 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 a is a relative ETT gauge that needs to be calibrated periodically to peak EGT. Um, and and it's, it's, it's not calibrated for a reason. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I understand. I See? spent about $50,000 on avionics recently, but... Uh, but no engine one of them, monitor. One of them's not an engine <laughs> no monitor. engine monitor? You spent that <laughs> no kind of money monitor. and didn't get an engine monitor. Oh, That's man. Right. Oh. The, well, the one thing you could have put in the airplane that might have returned something on your investment, and you didn't choose that's, that. That's exactly right. How, know, badly, how, how badly shiny should, things should, are. How badly should we beat Reed up? I, no, you know, he's on. indicative of quite a few people. I, I think he may be in for a bruising here. <sighs> Uh, well, I was prepared for the how can you fly 172 for six hours nonstop. Ah. Oh, no, I got that. Good point. Yeah. Why? Uh, it's why called would you, arrow tip tanks. Yeah. You, why would you want to do that for you, six you, hours straight? You, whole you, bring a, you bring a relief bottle. That's what you do. Yeah. That's, 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 Two. that's right. <laughs> Two, yeah. Uh, yeah. I prefer uh, Memphis, Tennessee, land. Greensboro, North Carolina, nonstop. Oh, oh there you good. go. Uh, well, that might. My butt can't handle right. sitting in a seat that long. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. Well, very interesting. But yeah, uh, and and Mike did his research, so you showed that you showed us all that Mike can uh, enrich uh, his own brain, not just watch us do it, <laughs> sticking our nose in the books. That's very impressive. So um, I when I occur, when I convert it to three sixty, I promise to a uh, to a O three sixty. I promise I'll put it monitor in it okay all right I oh guess so. so you're just saying you don't love the engine you have oh gosh enough. That's, that's correct <laughs> enough okay <laughs> although it's been more reliable than most cars i've owned yeah <laughs> well, all engines deserve an engine monitor in their stocking at christmas just saying so oh <laughs> in their stocking oh. thank you guys yeah thank all you right, for Reed. the question we love talking about this subject and uh enjoy that 172 take care Reed. all six right. hours of it <laughs> Bye -bye. okay well that's a wrap what did we get right and what did we get wrong we'd love to hear from you most importantly keep sending us those tricky questions and try to stump paul because it's very entertaining <laughs> send your questions and comments to podcasts at aopa.org see ya i think <laughs> bye everybody